Today we have uh, two presenters and the PIs of uh, our topic today, The uh, I'm gonna screw it up, but it's basically the Dunham Data Project. It has a much nicer, longer name. They're gonna tell you that. Our first presenter, well, not in order, but the first one I will introduce is Kate Ellsworth, who's a professor of performance and technology at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. And Harmony Bench is an associate professor of dance at The Ohio State University. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank them for joining us as well. This will be an exciting time and we welcome everyone. And now I turn it over to Kate and Harmony. Thank you so much, uh, David and Amber for hosting us today. Uh, and uh, so our presentation is curating and vis visualizing data inspiration through data and places that connect to Catherine Dunham's repertory. Uh, and it's gonna proceed in two parts. So we're gonna start by introducing the AHRC funded project that we've been running since 2018. Uh, the full title is Dunham's Data, Catherine Dunham and Digital Methods for Dance Historical Inquiry. Um, and we're joined in this project by postdoctoral researchers, data scientist Antonio jimenez Mathelard and dance scholar Tia Monique Uzor. So we're gonna set out the theoretical foundations of the project and then elaborate our three core data sets, uh, which we affectionately refer to as people, places, and pieces, along with key findings. Um, and then uh, toward the end, we're gonna turn toward our relationship with NADAC and our planning around the sustainability and reuse of data associated with this born digital project. So Dunham's data is the first large scale project to employ digital methods for dance historical analysis, focusing on the questions and problems that make the analysis and visualization of data meaningful for a dance context. And it does so through the case study of 20th century African-American choreographer, Catherine Dunham, who worked around the world for decades. Oh man, the closed captioning says Catherine Duncan. No, Catherine Dunham, who worked around the world uh, for many decades across many fields. Dunham is a particularly compelling case study because Dunham scholars have argued for needing better ways to understand her work transdisciplinarily, transnationally and transhistorically, at the same time as Black digital humanities scholars have argued for using digital methods to address African diasporic practices on a broad scale, while not losing sight of the particularities of specific connections as well as discontinuities. And I suppose just to say, in addition, Dunham was an extraordinary self-archivist. So in Dunham's data, dance is both a mode of thinking about archives of moving bodies and an object of historical study. And although the project really focuses on Dunham, there's a larger question for us at stake about representing bodily experience in the form of data. When scholars speak of bodies in a data context, it's often to acknowledge the risks of dematerialization and to critically examine how subjects and their circumstances are represented. This is especially important when seeking to represent black embodiment and experiences while resisting what Jessica Marie Johnson calls, quote, the devastating thingification of black women, children, and men that's entangled with histories of quantification from the slave trade onwards. Dunham's data attends to the bodies in the data and the ways that digital methods can help to evidence and elaborate bodily experience. Now, to create our data sets, we manually curate the data from a large body of undigitized print-based archival materials. So everything that we're going to look at today has been manually curated, not OCR, not pre-digitized. These data sets then find meaning and expression in tandem with exploratory static and interactive data visualizations. The core data sets for Dunham's data represent Catherine Dunham's whereabouts every single day for the 14 years uh, between 1947 to 1960, as she toured internationally, the almost 200 dancers, drummers, and singers who traveled with her, and the shifting configurations of the nearly 300 repertory entities they performed. Together, these provide new means to understand the relationships between thousands of locations, hundreds of performers and pieces, all across the decades of Dunham's career. We grapple with the dance-based knowledge practices indexed by each data point, the embodied intercultural and inter intergenerational memories of which Dunham's repertory was composed, 
as well as the physical toll of maintaining a transnational career as what Jana Brown calls a journeying Black woman performer across many decades. Okay, we lost not on mute, I noticed. <laughs> Over the course of the project, we develop ethical approaches to evidencing experiential and tacit knowledge in and through data. And for us, this has meant practicing a kind of slow scholarship, taking our time curating data from the archives in a manner that leaves room for kinesthetic response. The granular perspective that we use in our intersectional everyday analytic has enabled us to both substantiate and extend community knowledge around Dunham's transnational circulation as tied to her pursuit of solvency or what we've called Dunham's global method. From 1947 to 60 alone, she traveled to 194 unique cities over hundreds of trips on every continent but Antarctica. Upon learning about Dunham's extensive travel and the financial pressures she faced, a student who was trained in the Dunham legacy told us how it illuminated for her the reasoning behind the hustle that had always been drilled into her by her teacher, Dunham dancer Walter Nix. And so this is an example of how intentional data curation can provide systemic evidence for anecdotes passed from dancer to dancer through oral history, thus validating tacit knowledge and situated experience, but also making it more legible even to insiders. So we're now gonna talk through our three core data sets together with some visualizations before turning to the um, historical insights that arise in the process. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And hopefully that all turned out. Um, and just to note that these data sets that we'll be sharing today have been acquired by the National Archive of Data on Arts and Cultures here at ICPSR and are available online open access. And we'll come back to this point uh, later on. As we curate these data sets, we also visualize them. And this back and forth process between curation, analysis, and visualization helps us to validate and further develop data sets as we develop the visualizations. And many of the problems that we're trying to address require cross-referencing multiple data sets and joining them together enables us to ask questions at even greater scales. So right now we are scrolling through the everyday itinerary data set 1947 to 60. And this encompasses Dunham's daily locations, travel, and performances every day for over 14 years of her most substantial period of international touring. And we actually have 98% of the 5,110 days documented. Over this time, Dunham's personal and professional travels took her to 190 unique cities over 433 trips on every continent but Antarctica. So this data set is based on a wide range of archival materials from the cancellation stamps on postcards to dry cleaning receipts. We've used this data for statistical analyses that support cultural and political arguments based on the locations she traveled to and how long she stayed. And we've also built interactive visualizations that offer alternative interfaces for exploration. So we're particularly proud of this 3D space-time mapping of Dunham's travel in which time is represented as elevation from 1947 in yellow at the base map up to 1960 in red at the top. So here each individual trip can be examined in the context of Dunham's full travels at the same time as these 5,000 plus individual days come together to form a unique architecture that's a spatial rendering of Dunham's personal geography and travel. Um, and since we've been building this GLOW, we've actually expanded the data set to encompass 25 years from 1937 to 1962. One of the key issues with building an itinerary like this is that for any given day, the archives hold multiple and contradictory uh, pieces of evidence as to where Dunham is. So we attempt to reconcile these without erasing or simplifying the complications that characterized Dunham's travels. Instead, we try to understand why her plans were constantly changing. Our attempts to be exhaustive stem not from a belief in data for its own sake, but from a political investment in the ways that a slow engagement with data can make different aspects of the history shine out bigger and brighter. And here we're thinking with Trevor Munoz and Katie Rawson's advocacy for data sets as an opportunity for deeper research into the meaningful messiness of distinguishing features, overlaps, and similarities. 
The next data set, the personnel check-in data set, accounts for the comings and goings of Dunham's dancers, drummers, and singers over time. So this data set focuses on archival evidence of each performer's presence at a given moment. As with the everyday itinerary, the data on check-ins comes from scattered sources, so most commonly correspondence, payroll, programs, run notes, and visa applications. Our data analyses include statistics on performer employment and turnover, and we visualize this data in multiple ways. Importantly, we understand also that every performer comes from a place and that relationships between performers are created and developed over time. So through our visualizations, we try to situate people through some dimension of time, place, or relation. So here we ran a community detection algorithm to understand who shared the most check-ins over time. And here we also uh, represented this as an interactive chord diagram. And here we also built a stacked area graph uh, to represent the internationalization over the company uh, as they toured transnationally, evidenced by the par passports that performers carried. Um, and this is an interactive flow diagram that makes it possible to examine the connections among performers sequentially over time. So here we shade every performer from the first time they appear in our data from dark blue for the performers who joined earliest on to light blue for those who joined later. So you can click on an individual and trace their trajectory through the company. So this is Earl Wilson, who first appears in July, 1950 and remains with Dunham for a decade. And now what we're doing is clicking on a particular moment in time to see the full trajectories of every artist who shares that check-in. So this is July, 1955, they were in Mexico City. And you can see how in that moment, there are performers who are present as far back as 1947 when the data set begins and those who still remained in 1960. And we see this as a visual argument that traces potential lines of transmission. So some of the ways that artists could have encountered knowledge that preceded them and passed on knowledge that carried forward from that moment. The repertory data set encompasses a longer time frame from 1937 to 1962. And when we're talking about repertory, we're, we're only alluding to um, what happened on stage because we're specifically working with printed documents. So for us, repertory refers to how Dunham framed her work for mid-century audiences as archived through these undigitized concert programs and supplemented by show patter, correspondence, lighting plots, and so on. We catalog the various titles and descriptions by which the almost 300 choreographic entities might have been known, casting choices, including all of the dancers, drummers, and singers who were ever listed as performing in the work, the years for which we had documentation that the work was performed, as well as how many total pieces of evidence we have that it was performed. So this is a network graph that we built to understand one particular aspect of Dunham's choreography, namely the fluid relationships that we were seeing within the repertory itself as Dunham repurposed choreographic elements for different venues. Rather than a conventional appendix style list of choreographic works, which is how we might find this information represented in dance historical texts, Dunham's data has followed the performance program structure in organizing this data set into a nested hierarchy of named evening length shows, uh, containers, pieces, and named dances in dances. This network graph then maintains all the connections among the various elements without promoting a single definitive version of what a show was or what a container was, for example, and it also lends itself to computational analyses such as measuring the centrality or level of connect connectedness among different elements in the repertory. We incorporated paid expert users into Dunham's data, including dancers connected to this history through the Institute for Dunham Technique Certification. We're so grateful to see Penny here today. Um, and which is an organization dedicated to preserving what they call Dunham's living legacy. Uh, and we've also had some really interesting moments with these stakeholders. So for example, our representation of Dunham's repurposing of repertory, which we derive from Dunham's print programs felt intuitive to choreographer Sheila Ward, who recalled that when setting, um, resetting Americana, she realized there was no definitive version of the choreography and so hers would be different from other people's. 
But Sheila also noted that nostalgia, which was frequently performed between 1947 to 60, was a work with which IDTC was less familiar. And so this is an example of where the print, and just to show a few different variations of things we've done, um, these punch cards uh, let us see the evolution of particular nesting relationships over time. And there are other aspects of this data as well. So this was an experiment in creating unique thumbprints for each piece of repertory based on its shared performers. Um, and this is a series of visualizations that we built to link the, link the choreography to its places of inspiration, both on and off a map. Now we know that as a trained anthropologist and a choreographer invested in the African and Caribbean diasporas, Dunham was inspired by the places she visited, but she also choreographed works inspired by places she never traveled to or created work inspired by cultures long before she encountered them firsthand. So for example, Dunham created her island-themed folktale Raratanga in 1937, but as we discovered by noting her day-by-day -day whereabouts, Dunham's travels didn't take her to Oceania until 1956. Similarly, Dunham doesn't travel to Brazil until 1950, but her repertory is full of Brazilian references throughout the 1940s. Once she does visit, we can also see from the stacked bar chart on the, on the lower right hand corner there, how there's a significant increase in choreography inspired by Brazil and South America, which are um, uh, uh, rendered in, in the green color to the point where it rivals the proportions of her repertory inspired by the Caribbean, which is there in the, in the kind of pinkish purple, um, as well as the US, which is that kind of yellowish orangish color. We created this inspiration map to show a view of the world that is represented in Dunham's choreography, as well as the broad geographic reach of her oeuvre. All of the geolocation information comes from Dunham's program notes. And in the interactive version of this visualization, we actually uh, quote these program notes in order to preserve Dunham's own voice and to reflect how she herself made the connections between her choreography and her understanding of place. Such connections between these various people, places, and pieces are mediated by dance-based knowledge practices. And an ongoing question for us has been how to make visible those negotiations that are indexed by place, but not anchored to it. The performers who Dunham picked up brought culturally specific knowledges and practices into the company from Cuba, Brazil, Haiti, and elsewhere. However, their contributions tend to disappear behind the narrative that because Dunham was a trained anthropologist, her onstage representations of cultural practices were both authentic and hers alone, neither of which is true. With Dunham's data, we're able to begin to show the complex relationships between Dunham's choreography and travel in terms of how she reimagined and circulated African diasporic representations, but extended into other places as well. We're able to show how the company as a movement committee incorporated members that shaped and extended the group's embodied knowledge of rhythms and gestures. By bringing together fragmented archival documents of people, places, and pieces, our data sets and visualizations propose a new framework for analyzing the historical creation and transmission of intangible cultural heritage. So what we're looking at now is a dependency tripartite graph, um, which we built to connect to Dunham's travels, and those are in the left column with the label places visited, um, with the places that inspired her repertory, which is the middle column, and the passports that her dancers, drummers, and singers carried, and that's noted in the right column. And all of these bubbles are ordered chronologically from the top. Um, and the lines between them, if you look, you can see the gray lines that connect the bubbles crisscross. Um, those lines make visible multi-directional relationships between the sites of Dunham's inspiration, the places that she visited, and the culturally specific embodied knowledge introduced into the company um, as she picked performers up during her travels. And by looking across these multifaceted connections that Dunham herself drew between people, places, and pieces, it's really not only a question of how Dunham represented diaspora on the stage, but also how diaspora moved through these choreographies and through the bodies of her performers. And I think just something to stay here, say here is I think we started this project really ambitious. We thought we were going to create this idea of connections like day two. 
And then we realized exactly how much data we had to build to get there. And so it took us about four years to get to the visualization that Harmony has up right now. So we've done the quick tour around data sets and visualizations, and we can drop the link in the chat afterwards for our online portfolio. There are many more available from there. Um, if we were to summarize three of the key findings from this project of using a data-led dance history to analyze how movement moves across bodies and geographies. So first, building data sets at the granular level of the day by day requires attentiveness to aspects of Dunham's career that historians have not yet addressed. Our research has rebalanced the geographies with which Catherine Dunham is most associated, moving beyond a handful of cosmopolitan centers and prestigious venues to make her work in hundreds of locales more visible, including along the US West Coast, as well as her nightclub performances. And in a way, this opens up a, an analysis of her larger oeuvre. The second thing is that we've also shown how dance history's organizing fictions of the work, the company, the tour, these all fail as concepts for Dunham, who constantly adjusted her repertory and casting, as well as altered her touring routes in response to the circumstances she encountered on the ground. Data-led research can evidence and elaborate these tacit histories that pass orally through dance communities, such as how Dunham picked up performers as she traveled, and how they contributed culturally specific gestural and rhythmic information to the embodied knowledge base of the community and took ways of moving with them as they left. The third thing that we want to point out is that the choreographies that dance historians consider to be canonical for Catherine Dunham don't necessarily correlate with how frequently they were performed, how long they stayed active in the repertory, or how many performers were ever cast in those works. Network analysis offers an alternative approach to evaluating the relative importance of Dunham's choreography through its levels of connectedness. We also have um, more to say about how dance-led approaches could change work with data more broadly, but we're gonna save that for another talk. So now we're gonna turn to our work in terms of sustainability and particularly our relationship to NADAC. Um, so for us, it was really fate that our data sets arrived at NADAC. So we met Amber Amon Ra at the 2020 Collegium on African Diaspora Dance, uh, right before everything shut down for the pandemic, um, right before. Uh, and Amber is now a Director of Project Management and User Support at ICPSR. Uh, but Amber also grew up in the Dunham community because her mother, Kent Penny Godbaldo, is a former co-director of the Institute for Dunham Technique Certification. Um, so Amber introduced herself to us and asked what we were doing with our data, swiftly making a compelling case for, for why we should work with ICPSR and NADAC, where the data could be housed alongside other arts data sets with a strong in-house connection to Catherine Dunham's legacy to ensure that these data sets were looked after and were available open access. Um, and we remain so grateful to Amber for facilitating this acquisition and to David, to Lynette, to Anya for overseeing the project and of course to the NEA for subsidizing the ongoing care of our data sets. So I think now Kate is actually gonna pull up um, the, the website, the NADAC website. So all of the data sets we've been discussing in terms of um, both the data and the visualizations are gathered together as a Dunham's data series in the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture. Each data set has its own DOI, which enables us to release updated versions as we extend the time span encompassed by each. Our first version of the everyday itinerary only encompassed 1950 to 1953. What we have available right now is 1947 to 60, um, and we hope to release 1937 to 62 very soon. Similarly, the personnel check-in data set encompasses 1947 to 60, and we're working toward a release of 1937 to 62. And that is the time frame. that longer time frame is what is already covered by the repertory data set. And if you are interested in learning or, or being uh, notified about uh, releases, you can uh, sign up right on the series page. Um, 
there's also, along with the data sets, you can download user guides. And when we first started working on the acquisition of the 50 to 53 data set itinerary in 2020, that was our first data set, David asked us for a code book. And we were a little like, mm, what's a code book? Um, so the traditional code book, as he sent us some examples. And what we discovered is that a traditional code book didn't work but at the same time, we needed to be clear where the information came from and how certain columns depended on others. So for example, we handed over our data initially for processing. Um, Nadex started to kind of slice and dice the data the way they would normally do. And we started to see how that these methods of handling data involved taking every column independently. Um, whereas coming from the humanistic pro uh, perspective that we'd structured it with, it broke the connections between columns that we always saw as inter intrinsically related. We were reading these like humans. Um, and so for example, if NADAC ran a report on the number of performances that Catherine Dunham did in a generically named theater, like the Grand Theater or the Palace Theater, well, theaters have that name all over the world. So then it would end up pulling together performances in multiple cities because lots of cities have a Grand Theater. Um, and so that helped us to begin to understand that our user guide needed to explain that the venue column needed always to be tied to the city column. It could never be pulled apart. Um, and that these are things that are kind of obvious to us as performance scholars, but became more um, important to name as we began to think about sharing our data with folks coming from outside of the discipline. Um, and more importantly, our manually uh, curated data relies on a series of decisions in terms of data structuring and curation. Um, so this is, an, this is our user guide. We have a long explanation of what we think each data set, this is the user guide for uh, the repertory data set specifically. Each data set has its own introduction, which has some info about the project, um, and then some more specific um, information about that data set in particular and how it, it derives its structure overall. Um, and then we have a paragraph that explains uh, the, the creation and auditing process that in addition to being manually curated, everything that we present has been audited multiple times by multiple members of the project team. So we make sure to include a detailed explanation of this process in the data set. Then we walk folks through different data types that are important for the research and some of the decision making around them. So, um, for example, the repertory data set, what have we counted as a work or not? How are we deciding AKAs? Um, if we're thinking about the number of events documented, then how do we think someone else might use this to begin to think about relative frequency or as a proxy for frequency, even if it's not an absolute number? what's included and excluded when we say a featured performer, because of course Dunham has folks who, there's a company and then there's the times the folks are named. And if we just collect the named folks alone, there are a whole bunch of people we have in the personal personnel check-ins who never show up in the repertory. So beginning to explain what does it mean to talk about someone as featured in terms of the way they show up in the archives. Um, and then also because we have this hierarchy, we then have a long explanation of how to read that directionality. Um, and then at the bottom, we explain the way our notes and our source columns work. So um, what's included in notes? How do, when we've made decisions, what are we gonna leave information for others to be able to follow our work? Um, and then of course, what are the most important, the codes for our most important archives? Um, and just to say, our user guides also say what we don't release directly. So for example, our data on performer passports is only released in an aggregated year by year form instead of person by person. And this is a, a big decision for us, but it feels to us that just because this information is available from public archives doesn't mean it's easily accessible. In and so in particular with data that's more closely related to personal information, we're cautious about making it too easily consumable. Um, okay, so all of the visualizations we've shared today can be found through our online portfolio, and I'm just going to um, put that in the chat um, at dunhamsdata.org. We use this portfolio as a way to maintain all of the connections between our different outputs. So we've we've got 
visualizations that are static, ones that are interactive, data sets, essays, et cetera, et cetera. And we wanted to maintain the connections regardless of their mode or medium. So you'll find links to all of these things on the, on the portfolio pages. Um, and as Kate scrolls, you'll see that there's also um, uh, links to the essays we've published, the related visualizations, the related images, um, and at the very bottom, uh, we've embedded um, demonstrations of the interactive visualizations themselves. We're very aware that that interactive visualizations can go, you know, can can be made obsolete very quickly by a software change. So we're also cognizant of of um, how this becomes another form of archive. And um, if you're interested in the interactive visualizations that Antonio Jimenez Naviard has been working on uh, for this project, um, as our data scientist, he's been working to put together port, um, uh, tutorials for all of them, um, which will be released on GitHub uh, very soon. We're excited about that. So we've also been trying to think about um, different uses for this data across different populations. We put together a blog post recently that um, offers some prompts for using our data visualizations and the underlying data for um, upper level high school and lower level undergraduate audiences. And we think that the data and visualizations can be used to teach elements of both dance history as well as um, uh, information literacy, and we're eager to really be able to continue to find ways that the performing arts in particular can be part of larger conversations around data curation, data ethics, and community engaged qualitative and quantitative research. So for example, the personnel check-in data set and the core diagram um, could support students researching interpersonal networks and affinity groups, strong and weak ties, and the significance of those who connect different generations. And we also have a teaching toolkit, um, which is a small PDF package of um, letters and other primary source documents from the archives uh, that students can treat like a, like a scavenger hunt to figure out where Dunham was traveling and when. And this actually gives them a feeling for what it is like to be in the archives a little bit, which can be intimidating. Um, and how to interpret archival documents and also how to convert uh, information drawn from such documents into data for a project like this. There's also so much research happening on the transnational connections uh, made by leading Black artists and intellectuals in the 20th century that it would also be really interesting for students to do a kind of um, comparative analysis between Dunham's travels and those of these other critical figures to determine where they might have crossed paths. Um, so this has been a journey both in this project and more broadly for Harmony and I, we started working together almost 10 years ago, 2013, with this question about how the field of dance can make use of digital methods. Um, but as we've been doing this, we also became convinced that we actually needed to be asking the reverse. How can the digital humanities learn from dance? Existing methods for digital humanities were not made for the complexity of embodiment as our field demands it. We think that registering corporeality in and through data amplifies the contributions that digital methods can make to the study of embodied knowledge, but also poses unique challenges. And so our newest project, Visceral History of Visual Arguments, Dance-Based Approaches to Data, is an answer to precisely this question. Um, so we'd love to hear about all the fabulous things you do with these data sets. Um, and for right now, we're really excited to have a conversation and we also know we're covering a lot quickly, so we're really happy to return to any visualizations or data sets that you want to discuss in more detail. Thank you so much for being here and let's chat. Yes, thank you all so much for that. I get so much out of it um, every time I uh, learn more and more about the data set. Um, so Folks, please feel free to include your questions in the chat and the Q&A right now. Um, David, do you wanna get us started with maybe one that was added? Yes, I'd be happy to. All right, so first off from the Q&A, um, I just wanna acknowledge uh, that uh, Ms. Godboldo uh, 
reply back to you to say, thank you, ladies. I am pleased to see you present again. Um, I wanted to take special note of that. Um, and the fact that her daughter as well, Amber, um, was also very appreciative of your acknowledgement. Um, and then we have a question here that says, uh, this is such an amazing project. I'm inspired every time I hear you present about the work. How did you get interested in this project and this type of data work in general? Have you had to learn or invent new methods as you go? Both of you touched on this some, but yeah. Go for it, Kate. Sure, I was trying to put in a link to our mailing list simultaneously, but I can't uh, multitask. Um, so I think this is really, we found our way into this project uh, over time. So Harmony and I first started working together, if we go back to the origin story, um, Harmony had been thinking about how dance circulates on the internet. Um, her first book is about YouTube memes and she can explain this better than I can. But basically Harmony had been thinking about how dance circulates and was like, what could digital methods do to help us keep understanding dance? Um, and Dan, particularly thinking about circulation, I would, I, I'm, I'm a historian and I'd been doing a lot of work on how dancers circulate transnationally, kind of especially my work started initially in sort of Germany and German exiles, sort of traveling through the world. Um, and I, I kept finding myself making lists. The, all, there were all these people in all these places and they kept meeting people. And so I kind of landed on building what were like baby data sets as a way to start collecting all these people and try to just hold on to all this information simultaneously. And so Harmony came going, I know about circulation and digital, what does that do for dance? I came going, I'm, I'm due history and I'm making all these lists of things, but we were both working in this question about dance and transnational and data. Um, and that was how we found our way together. Do you want to pick up from there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll also say for myself, not being trained as a historian, but coming into a dance department where it was for a time my job to teach dance history, I, I also was trying to figure out how to make dance history interesting to me. Um, and this was this kind of grew out of uh, attempts I was making to to um, engage with dance history in a way that wasn't just that is very much about names and dates, but in a way that maybe works a little bit better for my my brain. Um, in terms of, I would say that we've had to invent nearly everything <laughs> that we do, um, and and maybe also actually more than we perhaps needed to, um, uh, just because importing methods that are perhaps very well developed. Um, in the social sciences, for example, um, don't always make um, good partners for some of the humanities focused questions that we have. And also I would say that, that um, in the humanities and in the field of dance, there's a strong anti-quantitative bias. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the work we've been doing is really thinking about that connection um, between dance and the, and the digital and the, the data and the quantifiable. Um, but making sure that we're always uh, approaching it from a perspective that is meaningful for dance and for dance history, um, since that is kind of where our um, hearts are. But also, as, as Kate was mentioning, um, bringing, bringing what dance knows, bringing what performance knows um, into these other areas of inquiry as well. Um, our process, like we started in on our process, but that the reason, well, one reason uh, that we iterated across all of the versions of our data set is because we, we, we bit off the 50 to 53 time period because we could manage it. And we taught ourselves how to do this work <laughs> with just that four year period. Um, so like, what does it mean to build a data set? How do we, you know, we didn't create, none of this work is data none of this work is built on a database. It's all Google Sheets. Um, so what does it mean to establish relationships <laughs> in, a, in a flat data set? What so, columns are important to include? And actually when Tia Monique, for example, at the repertory, when Tia Monique jo joined our team, Harmony and I all had already built one version of the repertory data set. And in a way for her to both audit us and learn the data, the first thing we assigned her to do was take the structure we created and go back through all the archival materials again and build it from scratch. And then we're gonna compare them. 
And while she did it, she actually came back to us and she came in with a pit. Once she got a little comfortable, she came into with a pit. She's like, I think this column is actually two columns. She's like, oh, we, we've got to do it again. And so I think that sort of iterative revisiting, repackaging, and then also we've now started working in the archives of another choreographer. And one of the things we're discussing is that a lot of the columns and a lot of the ways of understanding and structuring data that are right for Dunham carry over and some don't. There are some places where the uniqueness of individual artists, and we're always aware of this from, on the one hand, we want data be, to be somewhat interoperable, but also we want data structures that belong to their subjects, that, that are made to really show the information that the archives hold Very and tailored. the particularities of the practice and the artist. Hey, Kate, can you speak more to that? I think one of the questions, we're getting a little bit to that point. They were talking about curation and how you mm -hmm. um, kind of curated the gestures and um, the data in general and what that process was like, just in the normal, mm -hmm. not normal, but in the traditional ways that we think of data curation, as Harmony mentioned, it's the quantifiable, the numbers. Um, so we would love to hear about the uniqueness of curating this data. Mm -hmm. So something Harvey and I have been talking about a lot is this question of like, what can we possibly hold in data? We hold people and dates and places and kind of maybe sequential pathways and the kinesthetic, it, we, we think about this a lot as um, we talk about it as a visceral data analysis. That's something that happens between. That's something that's never gonna be in the data itself. It's gonna be in how it gets put together. It's gonna be in, the room for someone to try to put those together. So even when we're trying to do that complex mapping, we have that tripart uh, diagram with the kind of multi-directional lines between all of these things. It's just dots and lines that are in a sequence that stand for a lot of things. And what we're asking people to do is to imagine, or is similarly when we think about the flow diagram, right? We say, well, these are potential lines for transmission of knowledge. This isn't actually, there are lots of other ways people we know this, people are in the room all together all the time. They don't actually have any relationship. Um, so I think it's all about what can we know? What can we find out? And what are the possibilities of understanding? So if we start to see that wavy line of the Sankey, right? And we start to understand, well, dance is passed from body to body. Well, who's in the room? Who is in the room longer? What pieces of repertory are at that point in time? And so I think it's always this back and forth between this kind of very blunt data in a way. And the kinesthetic response is what it takes to imagine dance in and between those points. Yeah, I would just add um, that because we are not uh, Dunham, we're not trained in the Dunham technique. Um, we don't have a, a long embodied history with this movement community, although we are deepening our relationship. Um, uh, we're not actually working with the gestures themselves or with the rhythms themselves. Instead, we're, we're having this question about what kinds of information do people carry in their bodies that is culturally specific. And in, if we think about um, uh, performers arriving from a place, um, and if we are attuned to the names that, that Dunham is using for these rhythms and for these uh, pieces of repertory, those are all different signals to us. Um, they, they, they signal location, they signify lo location and um, embodied knowledge. So there's a lot of like um, information that we're bringing to bear on the data we find in the archive. And there's a lot that um, gets actually um, borne out in our um, like essays an, an analysis as compared to like we don't actually believe that that a visualization can tell you everything that you need to know or that the data itself can tell you everything that we need to know we need to know so we try to keep the relationships um, so that we can elaborate on the things that are very difficult to actually make visible that are based in, in dance-based knowledge. And also, you know, as we mentioned earlier, working with um, experts from the IDTC community to fill out and flesh out some of those things that are not readily available to our eyes as well. And just to say something that we've just started doing under the new project. So this Dunham's data was entirely based on archives. It was based on a particular way that dance history lives in archives. 
And as we mentioned, I feel like we've had these some really rich conversations about how that's similar and different from the kind of labeling legacy, the way dance history moves from generation to generation and person to person in kind of studio and in dance communities. And so something that we're actually working with is uh, uh, Penny Godbaldo, Patricia Wilson and Rochelle Tavernier has, have been working with Harmony and Tia Monique and I um, since last spring to really begin to explore what a dance history data set looks like that begins from studio, from, from the way dance historical knowledge is held from body to body. And so that's um, maybe something we could talk about. I'd be happy to, I don't wanna to totally take a right hand turn. Um, but I feel like that's been really, really important for us to think about how do some of the things we've been thinking about with generations, how do some of the ways we think about movement that are limited by some of these ways of approaching data, what would it be different if it's a data set that's, that begins from and is structured by um, that other way that dance lives in, in, in communities and in studios? Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from Nolan Lapierre. Uh, can you please tell us which visualization platform or tool you use to create the visuals? Um, there's interest in that. So there is a lot of, if I have a moment, I can pull it up. We did, we recently did an audit where we pulled up, um, we did everything that all, all the, all the different code and various packages that our visualizations are built on. And it's about four or five packages per visualization. Um, but I think the short version is our wonderful data scientist, Antonio, uh, he primarily works in Python and is pulling together a bunch of different uh, packages. You know, some are like D3, some are, um, some of, in some cases he's more adapting uh, existing packages and in some cases he's having to go farther off on his own. And that is one of our projects here is because we have ended up doing a lot of custom builds of things. Um, we have on our GitHub, one of our plans is to make sure that we release uh, that all of that code and he's written up little tutorials that can go with it if folks want to. Um, along with, I think we, we he has little sample bits of the data so that folks can handle data and then flip it back into visualizations. So we are looking to, I think it's some, I think our dream had been that it would be released before this and it's been a busy February, um, <laughs> but stay tuned. We will uh, put a big shout Coming out on soon. our blog when that, goes, when that goes up. All right, thank you. We have about like six minutes left. Um, <laughs> just for your awareness, um, one particular attendee, uh, is begging for a YouTube playlist about this. Um, another attendee is wondering if there is any any potential for acoustic mapping of data or audification. Um, I'm laughing so, because yeah. Harmony's been pitching sonifying a visualization, and I actually just got in touch with a friend who's a composer this morning. That really is not our primary work, but I, just for Harmony, I, I am going to make a hurdy-gurdy piece of one of our visualizations. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it. I, I don't think that we have. Um, well, we've had a couple of different ideas about sound and rhythm and how we want the data to kind of exist in in relation to that uh, in terms of um, particularly in relation to rhythm and visual rhythm that's a, a kind of question that we're asking with some of our newer work um, but the sonification aspect I think is is really interesting and often also when people see the the globe one of the things that dancers in particular wonder is how to turn those spatial pathways into a movement score. Um, so I think that we would be very excited by um, anyone who wants to kind of reinterpret um, these data or these visualizations into other, other forms, whether bodily media or, or sound media or otherwise, I think we would find that very exciting. All right, um, this is from Catherine Scott. Uh, data and history are very different disciplines that behavior sciences, disciplines that behavior sciences 
framed that framed all of Ms. Dunham's work, choreographic and ethnology. Um, the cultural and sociopolitical framed her approach. She has written extensively about her thinking that evolved over time. Where and how is this situated in your work? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we don't necessarily, um, again, we, we defer to, Dun to Dunham scholars on Dunham's approach to um, her own body of, of literature and work. Uh, this is kind of trying to bring out and bring forward some other ways of thinking about that work that, that can exist alongside and illuminate aspects that, that she might not have, uh, um, that she might not herself have explored. So I think that in terms of how we're situating the ethnological or the choreographic or the behavioral in our own work, you know, the, one of the places that that our inquiry actually began was from this place of choreography and ethnography. Like, how do we get from um, the community to the stage? What is actually that connection? And as Kate was mentioning um, in describing one of the visualizations, like it's only at the very end that we were finally able to get to this place of figuring out what those connections are between uh, people and places and pieces, uh, even though that was really an initial question for us. Um, but you're absolutely right that thinking in terms of data and thinking um, uh, in terms of archival engagement and, and historical engagement in this way is different from, from Catherine Dunham's own approach to her work. You're absolutely right. All right, well, I think we're done. Uh, based on all the comments in all the different places, I know people really enjoyed this presentation. And we also have had like outside comments just about how much they enjoyed your style of presentation as well, and how well the two of you work together. Um, so again, we thank you for sharing your data with ICPSR, sharing your information and knowledge with the broader community beyond ICPSR and being a part of Love Data Week. Um, yeah, and- Please tell us what you do with our data. If you do anything, be in touch. We want we want to know, we want to see it in the world. Yeah, that's, that's a great plug and a great way to end. Uh, thank you, Kate and Harmony. Thank you for Amber and Amber and Amber Amon-Ra and that whole, <laughs> getting in that whole history as well. Yeah. All the Ambers, yes. Sorry, I cut you off, Amber. No, no, this was great. Thank you for having me. Much enjoyed. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day and enjoy. Thank you.